So the heart of this, as we mentioned and showed you in that top layer, which is vRealize automation at the core level, when we think about what are we automating from, right? There's two major pieces on the VMware side that have to be added. First, of course, is vRealize automation. Second is vRealize orchestrator, okay? Orchestrator handles a lot of the orchestration workflow processing for the third-party stuff that's out there. And what I mean by third-party stuff is, is that you need to spend some time, if you haven't already, on a website called solutionexchange.vmware.com. Have you heard of it? Show of hands, who's used it? All right, that's better than some of our Fed days. <laughs> Most people are like, wait, what's that word again? Let me write that down. Because it has a lot of great information that's out there, um, a lot of different workflows, intellectual property workflows that these vendors have created to help you jumpstart all these third party solutions and automating all these tasks, right? Um, so, as, so as you're looking at things like F5, for example, if you want to load balance F5 services with inside a VRA, you can just go to Solution Exchange, download their workflows, and start doing that tomorrow, okay? So that's kind of an example of what we're doing here. But as you can see, I logged in. I'm going to log on as a couple different user accounts so you can kind of see where role-based administration comes into play when it talks about those federation solutions. Starting out here is our catalog, and this shows us a series of different services and catalog items. All right? The difference between a service and the catalog item is like if you think about Active Directory, you have OUs and then usernames. Okay? The catalog items are the actual requests that you want to make. The services are what we broke everything down with over here on the left-hand side to try to make it easy to understand what you're looking at, right? So in this case, if I actually come in here at the top and I go to big data services, this is the very first thing I want to do. And as I mentioned earlier, how do I build a Hadoop cluster, right? So big data as a service or Hadoop as a service, right, is a common thing that comes up. And people will need to build Hadoop clusters to deploy applications on top of them, right? So today, we demonstrate them individually of each other so you can kind of get an idea of how things are built. But you can combine workflows in order to have it build a Hadoop cluster and then layer an application directly on top of it by a single click. But for this example, if I come in here and I click on this uh, micro cluster request, I'm going to open this up. And I'm immediately prompted with a description. The description is actually just a name for me to remember what it is that I requested underneath my request tab later. So I can immediately go over there and say, oh, that's what I was looking for. So for this case, I'm just going to just type some letters and click Next. But what's nice here is that with this particular workflow package that I actually downloaded directly from Solution Exchange, I now have the option that I can deploy all sorts of different distributions of Hadoop. So from an administration perspective, all I have to do is select. Do I want Cloudera? Do I want Hortonworks? Do I want Pivotal Hadoop services? I select that particular distribution, type a name for that cluster, and then the password, and hit Submit. And then at that point, all I got to do is go to my Request tab and then wait for that task to get completed. Right? So once it shows a successful here, I immediately know on the back end in my VMware environment, my Hadoop cluster is ready. It's built out exactly the way that I specified within that workflow. So that specific micro cluster was small. It was like three 100 gig boxes, right? But at least from a demo perspective, we can come in here. I can now manage the life cycle of that Hadoop cluster right from within inside of VRA. I don't have to go to the VMware side to be able to manage that Hadoop cluster anymore. I can actually manage those tasks right from here, and you can see how I can actually resize it, stop it, start it, whatever I got to do to that specific cluster. I don't have to give a user, a storage administrator, or anything like that, access to my VMware environment. Okay? So this is a big thing that we talk about heavily, which is we're trying to pull permissions away from specific consoles because you don't need to deal with that mess anymore of just setting up permissions properly for only one user to be able to do one specific task. Right? Instead, we're using service accounts on the back end that are enabling this that it makes it to where all that administrator has to do is log into this portal, and they have the access that they want to be able to actually request that specific Hadoop cluster. Right? And then they can manage said cluster right from the items tab here. Make sense? Kind of cool? So I want you guys to keep counting as we go through that. That's one console gone for the web client. That's SSH gone for all the uh, you know, puttying that you have to do basically to get into the system and configure your repositories and set everything up manually. Right? Gone. Ask the EMC guys. They know what I'm talking about. So that's two steps at least gone, two consoles for your day. OK, let's go back over the catalog. One thing that we bring into play is what about managing uh, you know, UCS environments because you may have a VCE deployment, you may have, you know, a piece together solution, you may have other hardware solutions, right? VRA is great because it supports all sorts of different hardware. It's very agnostic to the compute infrastructure. There's lots of recommendations there on supporting VCE for the structure because they've built it and tested and validated on that solution. So it's easy to go out there and say, look, I need to build a medium sized deployment for my environment, so sell me a VBlock 340 with this entire solution. But Federation's also open for attaching to existing compute and existing network in your environment. 
right? So that brownfield type of scenario, right? So if you have, in this case, I have a UCS environment stood up here, I went out to Cisco site and I downloaded their workflow packages so I can automate my service profiles. How many of you guys have UCS today? Right? Big majority, right? How many of you guys have to deal with service profiles on a regular basis? Okay. So not a lot of on-demand provisioning or anything like that changing. But when you do get to that point, you got to go to UCS Manager, right? Or go to UCS Central or UCS Director, anything like that. What if you just tied it all into VMware and VMware can actually go and manage all these service profiles right from here? So on demand, we can change a service profile for a specific blade within that environment. So in just the same way with VCE, we can go to that chassis inside of VCE and we can go manipulate the service profiles all from within inside of here. Okay? So I don't have to access UCS Manager or Central or Director or anything like that. I do it all from within inside of vRealize Automation. Right? Pretty slick stuff. When it also comes to provisioning physical servers, we can actually provision physical servers with inside this space too, because we can actually set this up for either Cisco, HP, or Dell underneath its current version, and we can provision physical servers, and it's gonna go through this process that when I make a request underneath a physical server box, it'll actually use service profile templates to create a new profile, assign it to that blade, and boot that blade up and start a Pixie installation on top of it. So, because you can do that with inside of the Cisco realm, or like I said, HP and Dell supported too. So that workflow packaging that you get part of the Federation has a lot of those custom built workflows already ready to go for you. So for like the Hadoop stuff and everything, it's a matter that you go into Orchestrator, you go to the workflow, and then you just have to edit the settings for how big of a cluster that you want to create for that specific workflow. So you'll duplicate it and then create different sizes that you're looking for and then save those and then you bring them into vRealize Automation to the catalog. So that way you have role-based administration set up on who can actually request that workflow and how to manage the auditing of it and the life cycle of that particular task, right? Okay, because you're getting the items tab, you're getting the catalog tab, you're getting approval policies within here because you can do baked in approval policies or you can also integrate with existing ticketing systems and approval systems that you have today. So things like ServiceNow or Remedy or anything like that can be integrated with vRealize and that way if somebody clicks on request, it could actually automatically open up a ticket request for somebody and require an approval through that ticketing system or you can use VMware's baked in approval policies that are built directly into side of vRealize automation and set them up there as well too. Okay, so you're getting a lot of that stuff on top of it. So be way beyond just orchestration workflows, you know, doing some of the heavy lifting because vRealize Automation also does a lot of heavy lifting because they have a lot of workflows natively built in to do the physical provisioning and the virtual machine provisioning and everything that you see or enabling you to provision to different hybrid clouds. That's all baked into vRealize Automation. Orchestrator isn't, you know, part of that mix. We can actually come in here and enable us to create data protection levels. How many of you guys have Avamar today? Anybody? Okay, a few of you out there. So typically you go open up Avamar Administrator, you gotta go set up your data protection levels and everything manually, you'll configure a gold, a silver, a bronze, whatever it might be, right? And then afterwards, once you start provisioning VMs or somebody else does the VMs, because you're the backup guy, right? They'll provision those VMs and they'll say, hey, go back up these machines and you have to go back into Avamar Administrator and go configure them to be backed up, right? So in this case, we can actually drive the configuration settings for creating those backup jobs or those backup protection levels with an Avamar right from within here. So a simple request underneath here, I can click on the request button and I can go through a task that is gonna enable me to actually set what type of protection levels that I want for as far as like a retention policy, you know, how many backups per day do I need? How long do I need to keep them for? And I fill out that specific workflow um, as this loads up and, and you can actually go through and submit it and it's gonna make that call directly to Avamar Administrator for you and create that protection level. So what's nice about that, of course, is that once that particular workflow is completed, um, you can actually go back through and you can actually set it up to where you do a VM provision process. Um, when you're actually provisioning a virtual machine, there's a drop down that says choose what gold what, or silver or bronze protection level you want. So when that VM is provisioned, it automatically creates a backup job for that machine by putting it in the proper folder inside of vCenter so it's being protected, okay? So pretty neat stuff as far as going in there. So if I take a look at this uh, particular workflow here, you can see I can come in here and name it, choose my backup target, whether or not I want to go to the Avmar system or the data domain, hit next, change my backup schedule daily, weekly, monthly, right? Choose uh, what week of the month, do first week, let's just say on a Sunday, hit next and then a retention policy for how many backups we want to keep it for. And then of course on that final deletion of the VM, how long do we have to keep uh, that last backup for and how many years, right? So common Avamore task you have to complete. 
So in this case, we hit submit, and then we wait for that job to complete, and in that way, that protection level is set up and ready to go. Now I'm going to show you when I log into my other account how I can go and actually provision a virtual machine, and I can just choose that backup protection level from a dropdown so it automatically gets set up to backing up right away. Okay, any questions on the Avamore stuff? So you can go in here and you can go to the request tab and you can see the successfuls or failure notices behind those request tabs. Um, you can also come in here and like these all these fails is because I start them and then I let them time out. <laughs> so, but um, you know, basically you can monitor from here. Underneath the infrastructure tab, you can go to the monitoring tab and then monitor the process of the workflow creation. And then of course you can check that particular product as well too, right? So I can go to vCenter and see what VMs got created and where they got put, those sorts of things. But several different audit trails across the board through all the product stacks, right? Most of them are right from within here that you never have to leave the Vrealize Automation product. You can just get to the monitoring tab from the infrastructure side. Okay. EMC Viper, as we mentioned earlier, uh, EMC is, is a very cool thing, right? So hopefully you guys are keeping count of how many uh, consoles we got rid of so far. So we're up to four so far, right? EMC Viper is where you really take a jump. How many guys have EMC storage today? Okay, good. How many guys have NetApp storage as well? Okay, Hitachi? What about Dell? All right, perfect. EMC Viper is a perfect candidate for you if you don't already have it. Why? Because EMC Viper provides you the ability to actually create virtual storage and be able to manage the storage of all those different vendors all from one single console. So it's designed for EMC and non-EMC solutions, right? So we can actually stand up this virtual appliance in your environment and it will enable us to actually control and manage the deployment of storage. So carving, deleting, everything, doing zoning, the whole works with inside of the Viper model set. So as a storage administrator, you don't have to be a Tachi expert. You have, don't have to know data on tap. You don't have to know Unisphere, right? You just have to know how to go into Viper and carve storage. Well, better yet, here's an automation workflow that I can go through and actually create storage all from one single pane. So I have a more customized workflow here that's part of the federation I'm going to pull up. But the idea behind this is that you need to carve new storage, whether or not it's to a VMware environment or just to a physical server, right? What's the normal process you go through? First thing is you have meetings about meetings, right? Everybody agrees, meetings about meetings. How many weeks does it take you to go through that carving process to determine where you're gonna put it, how big does it need to be, do you really need that big or can you get away with this big, right? You know, does it need to be stretched on top of a VPlex or can you get away with you know, outstretching it? Those sorts of questions. Once you've made those decisions as far as that goes, the next step is, is that you're gonna have typically two to three people involved, right? You got your VMware administrator. He's going to go through and he's going to actually sit there and go pull out what they call the port names, the WWPNs off of the ESX cluster to give to the storage guy and say, okay, here's my WWPNs that I need to pull. So now go you know, make sure everything's set up. Give me my terabyte, right? So normally that guy is going to go, okay, he's going to go down and look at your, your Cisco MDS or brocade switches and he's going to check out the zoning. Everything looks fine. And then he's going to go over to the uh, Unisphere system, carve it out, hopefully typed everything correctly, and then go, okay, you're good to go. You go the VMware guy goes back, hits refresh, and he goes, nope, don't see it. Right? How many times does that happen? Show nods. James, how many times does that happen? <laughs> so... In this case, when we're using Viper, and of course that's timing out on that workflow, but when we're using a Viper in this case, and we go through this process, what Viper is doing is it takes care of that problem for you. First out of the box, it's actually gonna go through and take a look and pull your uh, WWPNs for you automatically from the VMware environment or that physical server. Then it's gonna go log into your MDS and your brocade switches and check zoning. If zoning does not exist, guess what? It's gonna take care of it for you, right? Automatic zoning, so no more SSH and having to go into command line and work through the configuration of your zoning. You didn't have to log into the Visa of your uh, thick client or web client to access that. And then finally, it's going to go into your storage and it's going to carve that automatically for you, right? That entire process happens with inside of this specific workflow as we go and pull this up um, to build it and actually complete that complete automation process. So the only thing that you have to know is. Where do you want it, how big do you want it, and what tier storage do you need? Do you need near line, SSD, SAS, what's it gonna be? And then that's all you have to specify in that workflow, and it's gonna take care of that task 100% for you going forward, right? So you didn't have to be a storage administrator, and the storage administrator only had to approve the uh, actual request as soon as somebody hit submit on this. That was it, okay? That's three consoles gone, two administrators, and a ton of meetings, right? Everybody agree with that? Right, so what are we up to now? Six, seven? 
Somebody keep them count, right? All right, so let me log in here as a different user account so you guys can kind of see this. Thinking about role-based administration, you had an infrastructure administrator logging on before, taking care of infrastructure tasks. Now you get down to the point that you have a business unit that needs to have specific tasks done, whether it's deploying applications or building virtual machines or doing other type of storage tasks, right, that need to be completed with inside of this. They go log into the catalog here, and they have a completely different catalog that they're going to access. As we can see at the top through the bottom, completely different stuff within here, let's start at Active Directory. Okay? Anybody ever set permissions on Active Directory before? keep their help desk people from accessing certain OUs and certain tasks with inside of that OU and saying that all you can do is reset passwords in this OU. I heard one giggle, so they understand what I'm talking about here. Right? How much pain does it take you to go set permissions to ensure that one person can only do one task with inside of Active Directory? Pull that away from you, pull away that permission pain, and actually just put it into a vRealize automation automatically. Out of the box, you've got support for Active Directory integration here, so we can actually go do things like basic IT as a service task. So you can see here, like change a user password, destroy a user, enabling or disabling accounts, right, or creating a new user in our environment. So from an onboarding process, think about HR and hiring managers, okay? When this comes into play is, is that you have a hiring manager that needs to fill out a form, typically paperwork, send an email, whatever it might be, and then a manual process that has to go through the IT help desk, and they have to go through the process of creating mailboxes and user accounts and desktops and applications for that new user, right? In this case, we're pulling this into here, that all I have to do is click on this specific request, and I can go through and set up a new username and password for a person and have it automatically placed in a specific OU so security policies get applied, and then I have it attached to specific security groups for the finance department in this case, which also incorporates entitlements for specific apps and desktops and everything alike, all from one single interface, right? So we actually go through this exercise as a single workflow that we can complete that task from here from an onboarding perspective, right? taking the hands and the pain of going through so much from HR to IT help desk to hiring manager and pulling it into one single task that can be completed and actually set up in less than five minutes, right? Just the same thing as resetting user passwords. I mean, how often do you see things like resetting a password um, comes into play here that I need to go in and some, well, some employee of mine that reports to me has been on vacation for three weeks and forgot their password, right? Typically, they have to go open up a ticket and then they have to wait, right? How much time and money is lost by waiting on that person to get their password reset so they can go back and do their job? What if all they had to do is go to their hiring manager, the hiring manager just goes in and adds their username, types in the new password, and decides whether or not that password needs to change the first time that person logs on, hits submit, and then two, three minutes later, that entire job is done and that person can go back to work, right? IT is a service when we're thinking about that mix because we can actually complete that task for them, okay? Any questions on Active Directory? All right, before we jump into applications, um, let's take a look at some of the VMware private cloud stuff. So we talked about how do we do virtual machine provisioning and automating those tasks, right? Typically, let's just talk about how many different templates that you uh, retain with inside your vCenter environment. Anybody have a show of hands of how many uh, you know, templates that they're aware of are existing today? Would you say at least 20? Would you go higher? Right? Different applications, different versions, different Windows update patches, different Java versions. How many templates do you have just for like 12 different Java versions to support your apps? Right? Very painful process as you go through that and try to get that actually built out. Well, that's the part about what vRealize Automation helps take you away from an operations perspective. So as we go and request different VMs here, we can simply click on this particular request for a new uh, base operating system, or I'm gonna show you in a minute application services and how we can actually deploy new applications using a single base template, right? And it's a product set that's built in their enterprise edition of vRealize Automation. It allows me to actually spin up what we call application as a service. Okay. But from a traditional VM perspective, we can actually go spin up these different applications running in our VMware or Hyper-V, like I said, or Zen server or Red Hat KVM environment, and I can pull it up from here. So in this case, I can choose how much CPU and how much memory I need for this app. My administrator has given me rights to actually choose a range. So two to four CPUs, four to 16 gig of RAM, and then I can make that selection. The storage section is grayed out because my admin, when he built that blueprint, decided I can't scale it, right? I'm stuck at 50 gig at least initially. So down below, remember I was talking about the Avmar stuff. This is where I can simply click on a dropdown. So this workflow that comes with the Federation allows me to easily come in here and select and say, okay, I know this is a, you know, a tier one application I'm requesting, so I need a gold level backup. Okay, what is a gold level backup? If I highlight over this, you'll see here 
that it immediately tells me what a gold it is, in this case, is going to be uh, backing up to Avmar four times a day, right? So I know that's exactly the protection I want for this application because it's critical that I have a lot of restore points with inside this in any given day, right? So automatically backup protection, auto sizing. So with a template, you guys know as you go into vCenter and you clone, you're cloning at that size template. Then you have to go change all those settings manually, right? If you're going from a two CPU to a four CPU, you gotta change that. You gotta change your memory. Hit submit. And then have to go complete task and make sure the operating system catches up with that change as well too, right? This automates that process. Now what's nice about virtual machine provisioning within here is that we talked earlier with ticketing systems, right? This also supports things like CMDB, supports IPAM. So you can go to Solution Exchange and you can take and uh, download the IPAM supports for like uh, BMC and InfoBlocks and stuff like that. And you can actually integrate that. So as this hits submit and you finish that approval process, it's gonna go update your CMDB, it's gonna pull your IP, process your DNS, build your VM automatically for you, join it to the domain, change its product IDs, and make sure it's in the right OU with inside of Active Directory, right? And it's going to automatically back it up for you with the Avamar services baked into it. Okay? Send you email notifications that the job's completed because you can set up email notifications and all this. Process any pre or post scripts in addition to it so you can have any extra tasks that need to be completed there automatically for you. Okay? You with me on all that? So all those tasks, I ask, how long does it take you to provision a virtual machine today? Okay? When VMware first came around back in the 90s, what did they talk about? Months to weeks, right? And that's typically what you're looking at. Months to weeks. Now we're talking weeks to minutes, okay? You need a new application, this is all 100% automatic. And in fact, we'll even integrate load balancers and go add NSX load balancers on top of this and do all of our micro segmentation within here and build a router edge services and set up routing rules with inside of here too. So we can secure that application when it gets provisioned. Weeks to minutes, because these tasks are 100% automated. All I have to do is click submit and all of that will happen on the back end for me automatically. When you set up that foundation services with the federation, all that stuff is built for you through that services engagement, so you're ready to go and start cloning these machines and actually building them out and having all those tasks get done. Okay? Now, of course, the big question is how many people in the room think it's rainbows and unicorns, and how many people are saying I'm out of a job? <laughs> right? So every single task like that comes up, they think that it's something that is interesting, scary at the same point, but it creates consistency, saves on OPEX, right? So I want you to take that entire process from CMDBs to DNS to IPAM to ticketing systems all the way through your load balancer rules and everything, think of how many consoles that was. I can guarantee you we're over a dozen now. Yep, so there's workflow packages for both, right? So if you're an NSX customer, you've got workflow packages actually for that. Um, if I log out here, let me go log back in as my IT admin. And I'll show you we've got NSX packages built in. But you can go through and you can create router edge gateways, right? You can create firewall rules. You can set up logical switches with inside the NSX platform. Uh, and of course, we can create those load balancers as well too for that environment, right? So we can actually deliver those applications and then attach these specific workflows to the existing workflow so you don't have to process them all individually. You just roll them up as a single workflow, right? And you do that through Orchestrator so you can combine you know, two or three different workflows that will automatically create the app and then attach the NSX uh, you know, micro-segmentation components on top of that. Does that answer your question? Right, and as you can see, a basic one here. This is out of the box, so there's um, not a whole lot you know, that's... Uh, been modified in this blueprint form, but these blueprint forms are actually completely editable, so you can actually hard code some of these uh, settings within here. You can add additional variables to it, whatever you need to have, right? So like that backup protection level there, for example, you know, that's an added on blueprint form exchange with inside of here to ensure we can attach that variable to make sure we've got backups being protected there. Just the same way as in some of the Horizon stuff that we do, we attach things like if you're going to request a desktop, we'll put a note in there that says you're going to have to wait at least 15 minutes for this to get provisioned because it's going to go through a full clone process and then set it up, add it to the pool, and then entitle you. So you know, once you hit submit and that comes back, back as successful, you should be ready to go. But be aware, go grab some coffee. Right? Kind of cool stuff?
Yeah, like I said, the majority of these are canned. Some of them are coming directly from the Federation, right? So that's a lot of those hours that we're putting together is because you have that intellectual property that comes with the foundation packaging. So you're getting all those workflows as well too uh, to handle and support all of those, right? For somebody um, who is building extra workflows on top of that, there's gonna be some experience that you need to have with inside of Orchestrator to build that. Um, VMware actually has uh, two different classes available that they have for specifically for Orchestrator on how to actually write workflows. So there are two separate um, five-day classes that they offer for basic and then advanced concepts on how to teach you. But, and it comes to API support, we're talking about support things here for like RESTful API calls and being able to do PowerShell scripting or you know, JSON or Bash scripts, right? Are all being processed through Orchestrator because it can connect into all those different APIs to be able to support that, right? So that's where the extensibility comes in with Realize Automation is the fact that it's literally anything as a service because if you have an API, you can call it. Right, and a lot of customers do in that case, you know, because they'll look at it and say, "Look, we've got this particular product set that's not part of the federation. Can I add it?" And usually, my answer is, "Is okay. Do they have an upstream API?" Yes. Okay, you're good. So um, I can get you links for it, but it's actually out at education.vmware.com. They have two different. There's an advanced concepts and a basic install configure manage class for vRealize Orchestrator that's available. Yep. Yep. Sure. Yep. Yep. There's actually more classes than that. So if you stop by over at my booth um, when we open up the booth later, so I'll show you the links for it. So, yeah, we've actually sent several of our folks through it on our development side because of the fact that trying to get some of that exposure to building workflow packages and everything. Because as you open up Orchestrator, and you're like, wow, that's a lot of stuff you can do with it. Now what? Right? right? So. Yeah, that's, that's exactly where, where, where we're at. Um, you know, this is a beautiful front, front end and all the other things, but tying in the workflows and making sure you can deviate from what you're, what you're given, you have to have some pretty decent power. Yep. Yep, there is some aspects of it, yeah. You've got to have experience working with API calls and stuff like that in order to, to really write your own workflows. But the nice thing is, I mean, most of, the, most of us in the room, I mean, literally, we can go to Solution Exchange, we can download a blueprint, and we can manipulate that specific workflow to be able to make it work for us. I think the majority of IT folks can do that, right? It's a matter of that if you go, I have this app over here, how do I make that work? <laughs> you know, that's where the tougher question comes into play and, and how to do that. And that's why that class is important to go through. But definitely stop by and I'll, I'll show it to you. Um, so let me show you one other thing and I wanna show you the application services component here. So this is the Horizon integration piece. Uh, this particular setup process, if you wanna do this yourself, um, I actually wrote a blog article out there at blogs.vmware.com um, on how to actually integrate VRealize automation with Horizon. So you can actually uh, walk through the steps on how to get that specific uh, orchestrator plugin set up, and you can actually start delivering Horizon automation directly through VRA. So for you guys that have VRA but haven't had a lot of exposure to it, there's some step-by-steps right directly for that. But this is kind of cool because we can actually go through and administer entitling users to apps or desktops or how we can actually do things like desktop refreshes and recycling, right? All those basic administration that, tasks that we would do through Horizon Administrator are pulled out of Administrator so we don't, again, have help desk folks needing permissions in there, we can manage all that from within inside of the uh, console here, right? So we're taking care of that. So as somebody needs access to a virtual desktop, they can come in and make that request. Or this, like this workflow here, how to add users to an application pool, right? If I come in and request that, hoping our uh, Wi-Fi just didn't blink. I clicked it. There we go. Hesitation. Right, and as this comes up, basically we can choose you know, the users that I wanna to add to the application pool, and then I select the application pool, and that's the extent of it. I hit submit, and then on the back end, it's gonna go complete that entire process for me by actually doing the work of logging into Horizon and actually entitling that application, or multiple applications, right, um, with inside of that instance so we can start connecting into it. Okay, any questions on the Horizon stuff? All right, well that's loading there. Let me uh, go over here. So we talked about application services earlier, and I wanna give you a little bit of that so you can kind of understand how do we change templates going forward. So 
when we mentioned managing 20 plus different types of templates and those sorts of things or higher, I've seen customers that have hundreds of templates with inside of eCenter to maintain different applications because they have thousands of applications and they have thousands of versions of it that they have to maintain. And then they have legacy apps that have to have a specific Java version. So they kind of get you know, stuck in this world where they have an over number, you know, a, a huge number of different templates that exist with inside of eCenter they have to manage. And as mentioned, what if you only had to build a base operating system inside of eCenter, and then you were able to deliver different application versions, different Java versions, and everything, all from a simple drag and drop, okay? And I want to show you that. So this is actually a part of the Enterprise Edition. This is the application services component. In the current version, the release version, the 6.2, this is actually located here as a separate UI today, right? If you were at VMworld, you got to see some insights of how that's changing. But in today's version, we still have a separate UI for now. So this is what I'm using. Um, and if I go over here, let's just take a look at uh, the SQL Server, for example. I'm going to go open up this app. I have one version of this SQL instance. I haven't added create different versions. But then I'm just going to open up the Blueprint here. Okay. This Blueprint is simple. On the left-hand side, we have operating system templates. So I associated these templates here with a template inside of vCenter or a template inside of vCloud Air or a template inside of AWS, because you can support AWS within inside of here too. Okay? So I associated that template inside of VMware with this one, so I can simply drag and drop over a new operating system into the main view here. So we already have this one, which is right here, a Windows box. In this case, it's a uh, 2008 R2. And then we have over here on the right-hand side, external services and services. <clears throat> right? So if we want to push Cloud Foundry applications through here, we've got external services calling Cloud Foundry. And if we have only our own internal services that we want to install on top of that operating system, we just simply have to drag and drop it. So like this Microsoft SQL service right here. So if we take a look from the Windows perspective, it's a two by four system. I can adjust the blueprint here, set my NICs, my disk size, everything that I need. And then I can go to my application that I'm deploying go to my properties here, and I can set up some information, some variables specific to this installation, like one, where do I find the ISO or the executable for this? What username and password do I have to use for that share file you know, to get access to it, right? What type of database do I want to create? What SA password do I want to use? All the basic things of an unintended installer, right? So if you've ever done unintended installers of SQL or Exchange or, Power or SharePoint or anything like that, you're very familiar with those different types of variables. What's also neat about this is that here's all the PowerShell scripts. This particular application blueprint I downloaded from Solution Exchange, right? So this became available to me, and I can actually come into the uh, script here, and I can take a look at it and see what's happening, and I can edit this script to meet my specific environment if I needed to, right? So I made those changes already to where I can manage those particular applications that when it's done, and I've got it set up to load this, so this base operating system here, which is pointing to the template, and then it's going to throw a SQL on top of it for me. I hit deploy, and then it becomes a task with inside of here that I can actually um, go through and request. So if I log in, and I go underneath my application services underneath the catalog, right? Here is SQL Server. SQL 2012 is going to get deployed for me automatically. By clicking on that request job, once that is completed, I go to my items tab, and then I can manage the life cycle of said item. So here's that SQL application that it's showing me here with inside of this environment. And I can actually send a destroy command to it if I'm done with that box. But if I want to actually manage that virtual machine going forward, I can go to my machines tab here, and I can now manage all the life cycle tasks of doing things like stopping and starting it, managing snapshots, doing vMotion, changing the size of it, right? Doing an on-demand backup or an on-demand restore with the Avamar system, I can complete that as an action task with inside of here. Now, as this uh, information loads up, I can also connect into it via RDP, or I, if it's a Linux-based box, I can connect into it through SSH, right? So as I can see my list here of these different applications, I can go click on the SQL box, for example, click on Actions, and you can see all the listed available resource actions, all the lifecycle tasks that I need. So in this case, if I want to kick off a backup or a restore of that specific machine, I can do that directly here, and it's going to communicate with Avmar directly for me. I didn't have to go track down the backup person and work through that integration process. All I had to do is click on On Demand Restore, select my restore point, hit Submit, and it's going to automatically do that restore for me. 
Now, it may require my back administrator to approve it, so we create an approval policy that as soon as I hit submit, it goes to them and says, are you okay with restoring this, right? So you can uh, set that up as well, too. Some basic things like removing snapshots, if you're going to change disk sizes, any type of basic administration task that you would normally do through VMware or anything else, you can incorporate that as a resource action with inside of here and actually go through and have that as a simple task to do, right? So again, you no longer go to the thick client. You can manage all that from within here, including RDPing everything. Can those actions there be tied into an IPSF tool when you change control? Yes. Yep, so there's a lot of integration here with things like ServiceNow and Remedy. They both have workflow packages available in Solution Exchange, so you can actually do all the uh, management with inside of there, too. Yep. Outside of the request portal, these type of... Yep, these are resource actions, so they're just common workflows, so you can just attach a ServiceNow to that workflow the same exact way. Yep, absolutely. Okay, any questions on lifecycle management here? Pretty cool stuff. Yep, this is Enterprise Edition here, yeah. Yep, so you're, you're basically delivering what they call application as a service. Not to be confused with platform as a service, right, with the Pivotal Solutions, but application as a service. Yeah. Yeah. The, the big question would be um, how you define your design for you know the implementation itself, right? So, for example, if you're doing vRealize automation, you've got one primary data center and one DR data center. Um, obviously, from a DR perspective, you're probably not going to have that built in your primary unless you're replicating that VRA instance over to that other site, right? But you can set up a distributed environment to where you have you know, VRA running in both and set up load balancers between them. And that way you can actually configure both data centers as endpoints in VRA. So you can have that application there sitting there dormant and just tell it to go power it on and create that application for you in the event of a disaster. Absolutely. And then just have it set up to where the location specified is data center B instead of data center A. Yep. OK. Any other questions? And Site Recovery Manager does incorporate with this as well, too, as, and so does Recover Point. So in case you're wondering on that as far as of a DR perspective. Okay? So if I just take a quick peek out of here, I want to go look at some of the, uh, the bigger systems that are here so you can take a peek of how, how this can really simplify you know, a lot of things for you. Um, here's a clustered SharePoint instance that I pulled from uh, Solution Exchange as well. Right? So as you can see with inside of here, we have three different primary systems that are being built, okay? We have this uh, system here. If I pull this up, it's called the admin server. If I pull up this cluster of uh, systems, go to my details tab, we have a WFE cluster, and then we have our app server cluster. So this is seven machines that are all being built, has scripts all loaded within here to join into the domain, set up the SharePoint environment, all the prerequisites for it, so downloading all the necessary you know, .NET and everything else that has to be built within here. This entire workflow package is not something I built. All I had to do is download it from Solution Exchange, put it in here, test it, look at the error messages, figure out what changes I need to make to the scripts, and then I'm done. Okay. And I can roll out an entire clustered SharePoint environment and be able to scale that. And then I can attach additional services on top of this, like being able to do the NSX you know, pieces for the micro-segmentation components on it um, when it gets rolled out through the uh, self-service catalog. OK? All right, let me log into one of my other environments here. I want to talk a little bit about cost management. So I'm going to show you one of the uh, newer versions in here. Let me log out real quick. Make sure it's going to be nice to me today. It's a problem with demo environments. There's always a risk, right? Because it does get changed often. OK. 
Okay, well that's all loading up here. One of the other things I want to show you about is um, the pivotal side of the house, right? Um, as we mentioned earlier, Matt will be here, you know, to answer any questions that you have. Uh, containers come up quite a bit, right? Everybody's heard of containers, everybody's heard of Photon and Docker and everything else that are out there, right? Show of hands on how many people heard of it. Good. So Matt's like, excellent, right? So inside of this environment, Pivotal is great because we can actually deploy Cloud Foundry on multiple clouds. Not just your VMware private cloud, we can go throw it on top of vCloud Air, on top of AWS, whatever, right? We've got support that we can actually build this entire operations infrastructure to be able to take and build a platform as a service solution for third platform apps, right? And in this case, we can build these different spaces, as they call it, with inside the Pivotal space. Um, so I can see that I've got development, production, staging environments, and everything within here. And underneath those spaces, we can attach different services to that space. So if I look here, I can see like I've got RabbitMQ and Mongo database services attached to the specific staging space. And in that way, these applications can leverage those specific services to take and build out those applications. But what's kind of nice here is if I go look at this uh, sample demo application and I open it up, what we'll see here is, is that I have a basic application running. It's got two instances running on it with memory limitations and disk size limitations, and I can see those two VMs running right from here. I want to show you what's really cool about day two operations perspective when it comes to this is the fact that I can actually go open up this application, and like I said, a basic application streaming data to a database, right? And let's say I wanted to test out a theory of recovery when it comes to Pivotal, right? I got this nice little kill app button here, which is kind of cool, and I can click on kill app. Go back over to my Pivotal instance here. We can see the app crashed report, right? September 17th, it crashed. And you can see that in a blink of an eye, it's actually already back up and running because it would actually show up here as being uh, down and then it powers itself back on again, right? So here it comes. Right, and give it a minute, it'll power back up and it'll both be instances will be running again. Okay, and there we go. And what's also nice too is scaling in and scaling out, right? You hear a lot about day two operations. I've got an app that I've built and it's got to run for this, you know, first three quarters. We don't really do a lot with it. Q4 rolls around. We need to triple our workload because we have so much stuff going on and so many people actively using it. We just can't handle the performance of how many users are connecting into it, right? So in this case, I can easily come in here, change the number of instances I need. Like this, I'll scale it down because the quarter's over. Hit save, boom. It's already dropped the VM out. It's being powered off of, out of vCenter, and I'm running off of a single instance just like that. Okay? Where else can you find a way that you can deliver and scale you know, applications that fast and build support recoveries that fast? How long does VMware HA take to recover? Anybody know that answer? So just thinking about HA perspective, you should have VMs automatically starting up with when a failure occurs, right, on that particular host. All the VMs should be powering on a different host. How long does that normally take for the recognition through VMware today, out of the box, without even adjusting anything? Up to 15 minutes, okay? Up to 15 minutes. You saw with Pivotal here, what was that? 60 seconds, maybe less, right? We had an app crash and automatically recovered. Just the same way as I'll come back in here, I'll make this bigger. Rainbows and unicorns, guys. Starting up. Here it comes, scaling it out. Once it's done, go to a running state. We're now running two instances of this application. Pretty cool. As far as licensing and what? The applications, well, a lot of this stuff's open source stuff, right? You know, stuff you're building yourself, so it would be your own license, right? So different if we're talking about like SharePoint and stuff like that. So if we're looking at the application services blueprints so that enterprise edition, then obviously as you go change your versions and create clusters of SharePoint, those sorts of things through the versioning tools there, you have to manage your licenses independent of that, right? So vRealize Automation is not a licensing product. It can do inventory obviously through things like vRealize Operations, right? But it's not gonna actually do license management, okay? You'll have to use your own tools that you have today for that. All right, any questions on that? So we talked about um, other federation stuff too and how we incorporate a lot of different capabilities. So operations manager is another one here uh, that we can talk heavily about. And how do we actually do monitoring of compute, network storage, and more from one single pane of glass, right? A lot of people realize when you realize operations that it's primarily a tool 
used for operation management of my VMs and the performance of my host, right? Is that the common thing everybody knows it does? Pretty much here or there. Says to be an alert, says, hey, something went wrong. What about capacity planning or reclamation savings? You can do all that too with inside of VR Ops. And in fact, you can integrate VR Ops with vRealize Automation to set it up to where you can automatically monitor VMs for idle workloads. And as an administrator, you can go reclaim those VMs and save a lot of money by go actually going through and processing that reclamation. So instead of going year by year and saying, hey, I need a budget for more servers, I got a budget for more you know, licensing, not realizing how many VMs get provisioned and never get touched, right? How often does that happen? Is anybody guilty of that? Show of hands. How many VMs do you know of that you have in your data center that you know, are running idle because some application owner said, yep, I need it? And then they ask you how big. Oh, I need four terabytes and 16 gig of RAM and four CPUs. I'll be fine. Right? And then you realize you're using like 800 megahertz and one gig. Okay? Reclamation capacity planning comes from vRealize operations to help you with that and help you save on costs. Right? In this case, we can actually come in here and we can look at things around performance of not just our virtual environment, we can also look at our storage environment, our network environment, our public cloud environment. So I can actually pull this up and I'm looking at a VNX system with inside of here right away and I can actually go look here and check out read IOPS, write IOPS going on within the system, see if there's any alerting issues or anything like that and set up automatic proactive alerting through vRealize operations to be able to control that. If we go look at our dashboard list here, we can see a long list of stuff where I can incorporate and go look at vCloud Air instances. I can look at AWS, right? I can go to my view environment and go see how all of my uh, desktop pools and everything are doing in view. UCS and Oracle and stuff like that come into play for, as part of a, uh, um, an incorporation with another partner, um, a company called Blue Medora, right? Anybody ever heard of Blue Medora, right? So Blue Medora provides that, that extra step in vRealize operations beyond the federation that allows us to not only look at the compute pieces of it, right, because they have UCS uh, orchestrator adapters, um, but we can also look at things like uh, um, they have F5 in beta. They've got Oracle systems you can look at, right? Um, they're working on Cisco Nexus uh, beta adapters as well, too, as they announced at VMworld. So you can actually monitor your network switches, your compute storage, you can monitor non-EMC storage, because EMC has their own adapters for performance, but like everybody else is raising their hands, they all have NetApps and H Hitachis and stuff like that out there. They have adapters to be able to monitor that stuff too, right? So you can actually monitor all that with inside of Blue Medora as an adapter that gets listed with inside of this here um, and be able to actually support this, or like Oracle applications and stuff like that. So I would definitely consider that from an operations perspective that we're looking at compute, network storage, virtualization, all from one single interface. So I've been talking about how we're pulling 12 to 15 consoles with vRealize Automation. What about doing the same thing when it comes to operations management as well too? Right? And the fact that we can take our entire software-defined data center, the entire federation solution, and leveraging the workflows or the uh, adapters that come with the federation, in addition to Blue Medora adapters to be able to provide that. OK? Make sense? Any questions on that? All right, perfect. So, with inside of uh, vRealize Suite, there's another component that's part of the Federation. I know it's hot, everybody had lunch, right? They're just like, oh, you're killing me. <laughs> right, has anybody heard of Log Insight? Does anybody use Log Insight? All right, besides the VMware guy. So you guys do? Testing it. Testing it, do you like it? Have you downloaded a lot of the additional uh, content packs? Uh, yeah, I've got like the VR ops, NSX ones, the uh, Active Directory ones, some of those things. Yeah. 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 Cool. There's definitely an easy way there. So again, Solution Exchange, right, is what he's referring to. So to confuse everybody, <laughs> vRealize Operations uses what they call adapters, right? And then with inside of Log Insight, they actually use what's called content packs, OK? And then of course with Orchestrator, they call them plugins. Right? So just, you know, not only do we have to deal with the vRealize naming, but we have different names for these different tool sets that enable that SDDC messaging. But as you can see here, this is a dashboard view of a, a Windows environment. So I've deployed the Log Insight agent through a few different machines here, so I can actually scrape all the Windows logs. If you're not familiar with Log Insight, it is a centralized troubleshooting tool, right? It uses remote syslog capabilities that we can actually take and leverage our syslog information to get put right back into our Log Insight server to where we can analyze and troubleshoot issues across the entire enterprise all from one single pane of glass, okay? 
Here's a good story for you. How many times do you actually call VMware and you start working on an issue and they want to go look at your ESX host log files? Have any of you experienced that? Anybody remember the old classic name, Catalina.out? Right? They want you to go look at that file. They take a look at it in the ESX host and they go, nope, it's not on that host. Let's go look at this host. Right? And then they go look at that host and they can't find the error. Nope, it must be a problem with your storage. Contact your storage vendor. Let us know. Send us an update. Right? You don't have to do that anymore with Log Insight. So we can monitor, compute, network storage, virtualization, and application and operating system all from within inside of Log Insight by essentially actually reporting these, uh, these logs directly over here. So I have a lot of different examples here in my dashboard view. As you can see, I can monitor UCS or my VNX system. Uh, there's plugins for VCE, NSX, Horizon, Active Directory, SQL. We can monitor our entire data center and centrally locate that in here to where if I go and look at this specific issue, like this uh, spike here, I've got, um, let's see, three different alerts. If I click on that and I go to Interactive Analytics, it's going to take me over to the interactive analytics page. It's going to immediately show me the entire log information related to those three specific events, right? So I can see my long list of events right within inside of here. It's already filtered that out based on that point in time of these specific errors that I'm looking for, as you can see here, OK? But what if we just found a problem and we need to go take a look for it? So let's go back over to our dashboard, right? And let's just go back over to interactive analytics to load everything. Okay. Now we can see we're collecting all of our data. We've got a long list of information being processed down below, lots of gibberish from log files, right? How do we make sense of it? I can go to my fields here, and I can click on a specific field to filter by, or I can type in a specific filter. So if I'm looking for a specific host name or an IP address, I can just type that in here, and it'll automatically filter based on that specific request. But what if I notice that it happened at a specific time? If I click and drag over this, I can immediately filter and, and make that range down to that specific point in time. Now it's only showing me errors with inside that specific point in time that it collected that data. Pretty cool stuff, right? So in this case, let's just go in here and we'll go look at this one, right? VPXA error message. So we're immediately, by clicking on that field name, I'm only filtering by VPXA underneath that specific point in time. Does this make it easy to troubleshoot your entire enterprise? So next time you have an issue with an application, you can look at the app, the VM, the ESX environment, the you know, VNX environment, all the way down to the compute stack, everything, all at the same time from one central view. And that's part of the vRealize suite and what's incorporated as part of the entire federation solution. Okay? Make sense? Any questions on any of this? All right, so that's your three major flavors that we're talking about here is looking at from, you know, vRealize automation, log insight, and vRealize operations. So that's most of what we're talking about when we're talking about this entire infrastructure here and how do we scale out this entire environment. So let's pull this back up. Okay.